you know, something that was really interesting as I was re- researching this piece that I uh, came across was um, like I, I think that I think that you're right that it's important to acknowledge that there are have been and are ways of interacting with nature that are less destructive um, and that those are often associated with sort of uh, these indigenous communities. But I think it's also um, Christian Parenti uh, is good on this stuff. Um, But it's also true that like, you know, the Native Americans, for example, it's not that their their mode of interacting with nature was to just leave nature alone. Like you said, there was agriculture, um, but also they they burned down like massive amounts of, <laughs> of yeah. forest. Yeah. Um, but in a way that was like sustainable. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like this idea of like, we'll just leave it alone. And, we'll, you know, that like the idea being that like humans are uh, part of nature in the way that ecologists, deep ecologists say, but they're also, um, they're also environment makers, environment, um, effectors. Like we, we have an effect on the environment. It's just that, uh, the question is, do we want that effect to be exclusively destructive or -hmm. not? Yeah. You know, and I think that, I think that we probably won't solve the ecological crisis by convincing enough enough, enough people to like, (laughs) go develop some kind of concept of living with the land, um, that is, you know, anti-modern. Um, I think like we have to probably accept that, um, that part of the solution is, 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 is a different way of interacting with the land. Um, but not, but not sort of this mythical return. Cause I think even yeah. again, the mythical return is often, very susceptible to the fascist stuff too because you're like um you know you then you then you start like lifting up some kind of ideal concept of of the of the people of the volk um and that there's some pure way of living that's been um undermined and um you know something that i I reference in the piece is like these um uh, mass shooters who have referenced ecological themes in their manifestos, um, you know, they talk about a return to some kind of pre-modern um, way of living. Um, but the path to get there for them is to, you know, quote unquote, kill the invaders and kill, um, you know, the people who are overpopulating the world who are for them people of color in the global South. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of threads there that I want to I want to follow, but I yeah, think yeah. no, it's okay because I have all these notes, so we're good. I, I know what I I know what directions we should go in and and what we should okay, flesh great. out here, but but I do want to address this idea of the wilderness as being this untamed or um this it's it's seemingly it feels a lot like a settler colonialist kind of myth, like this sure. idea that there's the wilderness and we have to conserve it and protect it. Uh, you know, you talk about the early. Um, I guess ecological or environmental movements, the conservation movements that we see with, for instance, you you mentioned here, I'll just quote this from the article, but in the early 20th century, Madison Grant, a Manhattan lawyer, joined the conservationist efforts of Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir, who had found who had founded the Sierra Club in 1892. These men shared an affinity for scientific racism. Roosevelt praised Grant's 1916 white supremacist tome, The Passing of the Great Race, or The Racial Basis of European History, as a, quote, capital book, end quote. Another fan, Adolf Hitler, wrote wrote Grant a letter calling the book his personal Bible. I don't think people understand this connection between these efforts to conserve the natural world, as we see in the manifestation of natural uh, or uh, national parks, national monuments that are protected federally. Um, John Muir, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, are praised for doing this. Not to say that there's anything wrong with trying to conserve parts of the natural world, don't get me wrong, but there is this mis- people don't really understand that there is this deeply racist sentiment at the root of that, and that Hitler actually himself, like you said in this article, was a fan of these these movements, in a sense, a fan of these ideas. Uh so where is that 
idea of a kind of eco-fascism, how was that presented in maybe the early days of conservation, this, this fascistic idea that we see within Roosevelt or John Muir or, or Grant, as you mentioned here? Yes, there's a couple of things. I mean, for one, we sh- it's worth thinking about what the nationalist purpose of conservation was and even the creation of the, ma- of the, of the national parks for people like Madison Grant, Teddy Roosevelt, and John Muir. Um, Because obviously, you know, it's good. We're we're glad we have national parks. But um, part of the purpose was this kind of idea of reaffirming the American national identity um, through attachment to the wilderness, through attachment to the land. It's the same thing I was describing about European fascists. Um, So, like... The frontier, like, figured as this place that's untouched, untouched by civilization. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not corrupted by, uh, you know, industrialization, pending and and accelerating industrialization. And there was this idea amongst these people that, like, modernity um, sort of robbed the American man of his like vigor and independence and creativity. Um, and that needed to be renewed through the frontier and through, um, you know, uh, preserving this American wilderness where, um, where basically men could go to, um, to, uh, reconnect with this vigorous American identity, um, usually through violence, like through, uh, blood sport, like through hunting. Um, and in the case of the actual creation of the, of the national parks, as for the creation of the frontier through the murder of, um, indigenous populations. So the, 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 the national park conservationist movement, um, in the same way that Richard or uh, Walt, what did I say? Richard Dare talked about the land needing to be that 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 um, you know that blood and soil meant that the that the National Socialists could take as much land in the East as they needed in order to um, allow the, the the true Aryan people to prosper. Um, that's basically the same thing that um, was very live in the conservationist discourse of the early twentieth early twentieth century. Um, and, you know, I mean, also, also very much endemic to that rhetoric is the idea that this land was virgin, that it was uninhabited, um, which of course it wasn't. Um, right. and I think I quoted John Muir. There was this, he wrote in a 1901 collection of essays that was meant to promote tourism to the national parks. Just sort of like as an aside, he said, as to Indians, most of them are dead or civilized into useless innocence. So, like, don't worry about the Indians. Um, come to our uh, national parks where um, American, you know, Volkish American identity um, still uh, resides. Mm-hmm. There's also sort of a patriarchal element to this, like modernity is feminizing and the mm-hmm. wilderness is a place to reconnect with, like, virile manhood. Um Yeah, it's all kind of there in the mix. 